doing today? Doing good, doing good. Great to see you. Great to see you. As most of you know, if you spend any time around me, you hear me talk at all. You guys kind of know I'm a sports junkie. I'm kind of a sports junkie. I, I talk a lot about sports. It's kind of a lot of things I enjoy all the time. I've always been that way, though. I've always been just like a sports junkie. Even since I was a little kid. I remember when I was a little kid, I used to pretend that I was an all-star athlete. Pretending is definitely the word there. Uh, because I used to pretend I was an all-star athlete. Man, I remember when I was a kid, I used to take them one of those Nerf footballs, go outside my house, drop my parents nuts, kind of throw it up on top of the roof, and then stand on the side, wait till it comes down, and boom, make a catch, you know? You know? And then like, when I'd get really, I'd like, throw it off one side and run to the other side and wait till it comes down so you make the diving catch. Like, whew. And then, of course, you had to get up and do a touchdown celebration. Like, yeah, baby. You know, I mean, anything you could do. Because, I mean, it was awesome. I mean, you were like an all-star out there in roof football. I mean, did anybody else ever play roof football? Was it just, okay, okay. See, I got, I got you, Coach Sautel. Absolutely. See, that's a coach, see? Yeah, I knew he had to play that. So, um, and then uh, basketball. You know, I don't know if you guys realize this. I'm kind of uh, vertically challenged a little bit. So, um, but I love basketball. And I want to do what every basketball player wants to do. And that's like throw down a nasty dunk, you know? And so, so... My parents had this little, like, exercise trampoline, you know, the little old exercise trampolines? Oh, that made a great launching pad, man. I'd take that thing out there, and I would put it out, and I would just take off, boom, hit that thing, and I mean, rattle the rim, baby. Rattle the rim was awesome. I jumped on that thing until the legs broke off of it, man, just anything I could do, because... Yeah, you, know, you pretend, man. There's nothing about pretending. And, and actually, here's reality. I don't know that pretending actually ends when we're a kid. I think it just changes a little bit. I think when we grow up and we become adult, pretending doesn't actually go away from us. It just changes a little bit. Because here's what begins to happen. We put on these fronts and we put on these masks to pretend that everything is okay in life or to pretend that we're somebody that we're really not in life. And what begins to happen, we act one way in one situation, but in a different setting, we act a different way. It depends on what, what the environment's like and what the people around us are like. And because we want everybody to like us, we want to be accepted by people, so we pretend and we act certain ways. That's why you act a certain way when you're at work, and you try to put up a front, you put up a mask, and you try to put out a persona there. And sometimes that's different than when you're at home, and you act a certain way at home. And then a lot of people, man, on Sunday mornings, man, you definitely put on a front, man. We, we, we come to church, and we, we definitely put on a front. We put on a mask. We, we, we want to act the way that we think we're supposed to act. We want to be the person that we think the people around us want us to be, and they think that we should be. I think what we're looking at here in, in Paul, as he continues in Romans chapter 12, so go ahead and take your Bible and find Romans chapter 12. I think over these next few verses, what Paul is really trying to get to us is saying, hey, as you follow after Christ, as you live out this Christian faith, if you live out this salvation that we've talked about for so long, here's what he says, I, God wants you to come to grips with the real you. In other words, stop putting the facades on, stop putting the mask on, stop pretending and come to grips with the real you. Because when you come to grips with the real you, you realize, am I who God needs me and wants me to be? Or am I pretending and I'm something that God desires something different for me? When you come to grips with the real you, you realize there's kind of this self-assessment. Am I who God wants me to be? Or do I need to make some changes? Do I need to look at things differently? Do I need to do things differently so I can fulfill who God wants me to be? Because see, it doesn't matter what fake you put on. It doesn't matter what mask you put on. It doesn't matter what act you put on. God knows the real you. You can't pretend to be somebody that you're not and fool God. And so what Paul is saying here in these next few verses is this, I'm challenging you to come to grips with the real you. You see, we all ask ourselves uh, a set of questions in life. At different times in life, in different ways in life, we ask ourselves questions like this, who am I? We ask ourselves, who am I really? What is my identity? Who is my identity? What do I find my identity in? We ask ourselves this question, where do I belong? Where do I fit in? Where do I find my comfort? Where do I find my security? We ask ourselves this question. We ask ourselves, what's my purpose? What's the purpose in my life? What's the purpose of what I do with my life? Well, what I'm supposed to be in my life? And what is the purpose? What's my significance here on this earth and in this world? And I think that's what Paul is getting at in these next few verses. 
verses 3 through 8 of Romans chapter 12, is really, I want you to come to grips with the real you, with the self-assessment. Follow along as I read Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 3, Paul wrote this. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the propitiation of his faith. If service, in his service. Or if, or if he teaches, in his teaching. Or he who exhorts in his exhortation. Or he who gives with liberality or generosity. He who leads with diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Here, here's this self-assessment. Let me break this down a little bit for us this morning to get you to understand what, what, what I'm talking about that Paul is getting us to look at here. He's first asking us to come up and to ask this self our question of who am I? Where do I find my identity? Look back at verse 3. Verse 3, this is what he says. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but to think so as to have sound judgment. See, really, here's what he's commanded us. He's commanded us to think accurately about ourselves, to think realistically about ourselves, to not think of yourself too highly than you ought to. In other words, don't have so much pride in who you are and so much pride in, in what you can accomplish and what you can do in your own strength, in your own power, in your own knowledge, in your own wisdom, in your own creativity, to not think of yourself too highly. Because there are people in life that walk around thinking of themselves as pretty highly, you know? You kind of see those people, people that think they're all that. You know, all that in a bag of chips, maybe. I don't know. I mean, they, they, they think they're all that. But he then it goes on to say, he says, don't think of yourself too highly, but don't think of yourself too lowly either. Don't, don't, don't see yourself as a piece of garbage. Don't see yourself as inferior. Because that's not how God sees you. And there are people who walk through life. There are people who walk through life that see themselves as useless. There are people who walk through life, see themselves as 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 just messed up people, as insignificant. But I want you to understand this. I want you to hear this, that God does not see you in that way. You are not useless. You are not too low. And what he's saying here is don't see yourself too high and too much pride and don't see yourself as too low with this inferiority complex. The question that we ask ourselves is this, is, is who am I? Who am I? Now, we can answer that in a lot of different ways. For me, I could answer that very simply this. I'm James Pendleton. That's who I am. I'm James Pendleton. I'm a pastor. That's who I am. That's who I answer that question. I'm a pastor. I'm a coach. That's who I am. I'm a coach. I'm a father. I'm a husband. And you can answer those questions kind of in that sense that way too. And that will define a little bit about kind of who we are, kind of what some of our roles in life are. But that doesn't necessarily answer the question of who you are at the core of your being. And this is what Paul is asking us. This is what God is commanding us, is to look at the core of who you are, the core of your being, the thing that's inside of you, the character that drives you, the person that you are. I think when we begin to really understand who we are, is when we understand who we are in Christ. I want you to understand this. As a, as a, as a man, as a woman, we are created by God. And I don't want you to just blow over that. Oh yeah, I've heard that before. I'm created by God. I want you to understand this. You and me are, you are a creation of God. You are a masterpiece of His. See, He doesn't make junk. And you may have thought in your life that you're junk. You may have had people in your life tell you that you were junk. You may have made, had people make you feel like you are useless. But God doesn't make junk. 
God created you and He designed you exactly the way He wanted you. With your personalities, with your physical appearance, with your skills and your design. He created you and designed you the way He wants you. You are a masterpiece of His. I see this like when an artist finishes this beautiful painting and they just step back and they just kind of fold their arms and they just kind of have this smile on their face and like, I created that masterpiece and they're proud of that and they take that masterpiece and they maybe put it in a frame and they and they hang it on their wall or they go and they put all their work in this art gallery so people can come and awe at it and, and, and be in joy and express that joy. That's the way God sees you. He sees you as a masterpiece that he sits back and he says, I am pleased. I see them as beautiful. I see them as value. And I want people to see them that way. And that's how God sees us. As a creation of His. But not only do we have this opportunity to be the creation and the masterpiece of of God, but for those of us who have come to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior and enter into that relationship with God through His Son dying on the cross, being buried in the grave, and coming back in three days. For those of us who have come to accept that and enter into this relationship with Jesus Christ as our Savior, God refers to you as a child of His. As a child of His. When I begin to think that that God sees me as a son of His, I know the way I value my kids. I know how much I love my daughter. I know how much I love my son. And I know I would do anything for them. And I know I miss them when I'm away from them. And I know I love to just hang out with them. And I love to laugh with them. And I love to spend time with them. I love to create memories with them. And I love to dream with them about their life. And I love to talk with them about what they're doing and what they want to do in life. And I know what it feels like and stirs up in my heart to be that time, be around my son and my daughter. And to think about this, that God sees us as followers of his, as Christians, as children of his, as sons and daughters of his. So to think about how much he values us, to think about how he wants to dream with you about your life, to think about how he wants to experience the joys of your life and how much he wants to take you up in his lap and wrap his arms around you when life is beating you up because he sees you as a son and a daughter of his. That is an amazing thing to see that we are a son and a daughter, a child of God. I think what we got to understand is not too too highly of ourselves, not too lowly of ourselves, but to understand in ourselves and to see ourselves about what God is and what God's done for us more than what we have done and what we've done for Him. Understand what I'm saying here. We begin to understand when we understand who we are and my identity in Christ. It's begin when I begin to truly grasp and understand what God has done for me and who He is for me. Not who I am and what I can do and, and what I can even do for God, but it's more about who God is for me. I find my identity in being a creation of His, a masterpiece of His. I find my identity in being a child of His. That's who I am. A created masterpiece, child of God. That's who you are. A created masterpiece of God that has the chance and the opportunity to become a child of His. We begin to ask ourselves this question, where do I belong? Where where, where do I fit in? If I begin to understand that I'm a created masterpiece of God, if I've accepted Him and become a child of His, is, is where do I belong? Where do I fit in? Where do I find this comfort? Where do I find the security of being a part? Because here's the reality. We all want to do that. And when we think, we think of teenagers doing that, right? We think of teenagers just wanting to fit in. We think of teenagers acting a certain way so that they'll fit in with that group of kids. And you see it all the time. You see it all the time with teenagers, how they kind of change and they start acting a different way and they start maybe talking a different way and they start dressing a different way so that they can fit into the crowd. And we think that's, yeah, that's the immaturity of teenagers. Uh Uh-uh. You and I as adults do that so often. We, We want to fit in with people. We want to fit in with that crowd at work. We want to fit in with our neighbors. We want to have a sense of belonging that we're part of something. Look at verse 4 in Romans chapter 12. Verse 4, Paul begins to 
go on and say this. He says, For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. He, he's saying this. Remember, he's talking, to, he, he, he's, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to Christ followers here. So what he's saying here, we as brothers and sisters in Christ, we are part of one body. That body is the body of Christ. And we are all different. And we're all individuals. And we have individuality. But even in that, we have a commonality that makes us part of one thing. And that is part of the body of Christ. When we've come to accept Jesus Christ is our Savior. We've been called a son or a daughter of His. And these many different parts are joined together in one body, the body of Christ. I love how Paul, this is a thought that Paul says several times. I want you to keep your fingers in Romans chapter 12, but I want you to flip back a little farther into the New Testament to 1 Corinthians. Because in 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to the church, the Corinthians, in a city called Corinth. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, he begins to talk about this same thought. He's talking to that group of Christians, saying, hey, we're all different. You're different. You come from different backgrounds. You're designed differently. You've lived life differently. You have different baggage that you bring. You have different gifts, but we're all part of one thing. We're part of the body of Christ. It's the commonality. It's the things that unites us together. And he begins to give us this physical example of the human body. Look at this. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, look down at verse 12. Paul, again, is writing here and he says this, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body. He's talking about the physical body here. He's trying to give them a physical picture of something that they can understand. He said, I want you to think about your physical body, the, the, the blood and the flesh of who you are. And again, in there, he says, we are one body, so also is Christ. Verse 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized, well, slaves and free. We were all made to drink of one spirit. No matter what your background, no matter where you are, the differences that make us. There's one thing that brings us all in common into one body, and that's the Spirit of God that's given to us as a follower of His, as one person who has believed in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ for our salvation. Look at verse 14. So he continues this illustration. He says, For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, Because I am not a hand, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. And if the ear says, Because I am not an eye, I am not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them in the body, just as he desired. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And I cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers... All the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body and individual members of it. See, here's what Paul is trying to say. I think it's what he's referring to in Romans. It's what he's talking about here in 1 Corinthians. He says, I want you to look at your body. Let's give this physical example, this, this, this illustration, if you want to say, this, this object lesson. He says, let's look at our body. Our body is one function. It's, it's one body. It's who I am. It's me. But my body has many members. It's got my feet. It's got my hands. It's got my legs. It's got my ears. It's got my nose. It's got my eyes. And all these things function together. And they all need each other. It says the feet can't say, well, I'm, I'd much rather be a hand so I could pick up things. You know, I'd like to be able to pick up things. So I, I guess I'm not a part of the body. I'm really not that important. I don't want to be part of the body. And the hands can't say, well, I'd really like to, uh, to kick a ball. I'd really like to run and do those kind of things. But, but since I can't do that, I'm not a part of the body. And it says, if, it was, if our whole body was just one eyeball, first of all, it looked really funny. If one big eyeball, where would the sense of smell be? And if we were all just one big nose, where would the sense of, of hearing be? 
It says that we all need this. We need our whole body. We need all aspects of it to be who God's designed us to be. And then he makes the illustration and translates it to the body of Christ. The place that we belong as sons and daughters of his. And he says, we are all needed. We are all different. We're all individuals. We all have likes and dislikes. We all have things that we enjoy doing and things we don't enjoy doing. And you know what? Every single one of you are needed. In the body of Christ, for the body of Christ to function as it's been designed, that you are needed. And you are needed and you are designed for a reason within the body of Christ. And that's why some people are great at doing things out front. Some people are great at doing things in the background. Some guys are great at, at doing physical labor. Others are great at sitting at the computer. But we're all needed in the body of Christ. And for the body of Christ to function, there is value in your strengths and your weaknesses. So often we don't want to, to bring out our weaknesses, do we? we? We want everybody to see our strengths. And we want to put our strengths on display. And we want everybody to brag on how good we are at something. And we want everybody to acknowledge how good we are at something. Because we don't want people to see our weaknesses but here's the reality. There's value in your strengths for sure, but there's value in your weaknesses. That's why we need each other. That's why you say, you know what? I realize I'm not that strong in this area. I realize I'm weak in that. I need to bring someone alongside me to help me in that or to help me do this or that. It's that each part has its own function and each part of the body, the body of Christ, has its own significance. So in Romans chapter 12, when Paul is saying this, I believe what he's saying is this, understand that there's value in who you are. This is where you fit in as a son of his, as a child of his, as a daughter of his. You fit into the body of Christ. You are valued and you are, there is significance for you. There is purpose for you. You have a function to carry out. There is strength that you bring to the body of Christ. That's where you belong. That's where you find connection. That's where you find community. That's where you find comfort. That's where you find security. Then he continues on in that thought. Look at verse 8, back in Romans chapter 12. <clears throat> verse 6, actually. Verse 6 in Romans chapter 12, Paul continues this, Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. <clears throat> if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, giving, generosity to liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. What he's saying here is you have talents and gifts that have been given to you by God. You start looking for what's my purpose in life? Understand this, you have been given natural talents by God. Things that he gives you that you're just naturally good at. Things that he's designed in you that you are good at. And some of you are great at working with your hands. You're great at mechanical things. And others, you are great at organization and great at, at, at doing spreadsheets, which I, I hate having to do spreadsheets. But, but some of you are like, I love spreadsheets. They're like the greatest thing ever. You know, and, 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 and some of you really love to be involved in people's life and you love to be in front of people. You love to talk to people and you love having conversations with people. And others of you are like, OK, if I'm sitting in a crowd, I just want to be the quiet one in the background. And I'm good with that. You know, we've all been given natural talents. We've all been wired the way God wants us to be wired. And all of a sudden you start to look at your talents, what you do with your life, what you do with your talents. And you say, am I using this talent for the kingdom of God? Am I using this talent and what I'm good at, and what God has, has wired me to be good at, and I use that for His glory or for His purpose? And am I using that to, for, for that reason? One of the opportunities I have is to be around athletes a lot. And a few years ago, one of our football players from Florida Atlantic University was uh, getting ready to be drafted in the NFL. He now plays for the Washington Redskins, Alfred Morris. He's a running back. And Alfred and I were talking before he got drafted. And he said, James, I'm just wanting to have an opportunity to play the game of football because I love the game of football. But I want you to pray for me that I use this platform to bring God glory. I remember praying with Alfred a week before the draft and just praying that, that God would give him a platform. And God has given him an unbelievable platform. He's one of the leading rushers in the, in the NFL and all pro, 
Pro Bowl, and, and he's using that platform to, to make a difference for the name of Christ. And so whatever your talent is, yeah, that's a huge talent, and that's a huge platform that none of us really will have that level of a platform before. But you're going to have a platform with those three or four people that you work with. You're going to have a platform with those neighbors that you help do something. Are you doing it for His glory? Are you doing it to bring Him fame? He says we've all had these, these gifts, these, these talents and these gifts. See, when, when we become a Christian and the Spirit of God is put in us, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit gives us a gift. They call them spiritual gifts. It's the spiritual gift that is given to us by the divine nature of God, the Spirit of God living in us, His Holy Spirit in us, giving us the, the spiritual gift of something that He wants to use us in the body of Christ for a reason. He begins to go on here in this Romans chapter 12 and talk about some of those things. He says, hey, if it's to prophesy, it's another word for preach. If, if your gift is to preach, then preach the message of God. Preach faith in Christ. If it's to help, then, then help and don't try to just take over, but truly really try to just help and support. If your gift is to teach, then, then teach. If your gift is to give guidance, then, then be careful not to be bossy with that. If your gift is to, um, is to be put in charge, then don't manipulate if you're put in charge. If your gift is you're called to, to help people in distress, then be quick to respond. If you're, if you were to, if you're helped to the disadvantaged, then don't let yourself get irritated by that and just put a smile on your face and help those people. You know what he's saying here? Whatever your gift is, whatever your talent is, simply this, use it. You want to know what your purpose in life is? I hear people all the time say, I'm just trying to find my purpose in life. Just find a, you know what you need to do? Use your gifts and talents for God's glory. That's what your purpose is. Whatever it is you do in life, you do it for God's glory. You do it to make His name famous. You use it to, to, to put your gifts and your talents in practice for the good of God's kingdom. That's what our purpose is. That's what our significance is. So when you start to go to work, whatever that work is, and you start to say, the significance of my life is to use this for the kingdom of God's sake, I'm going to start finding ways to do that. If you say, hey, I know I'm good at this, or I've been gifted with this, and you start to look at it and say, you know what? I know my significance is found in, in, in using that for God's glory, to do something for His kingdom. That's my purpose in life. So what Paul is really saying here, really simple. Use it. Use your talent. Use your gifts. Use your who you are for the sake of God. And do it well. That's what he's saying. Do it well for his name's sake. See, what, what Paul is really getting at here is that, hey, you have to have this, this self-assessment. You've got to look into who you are and really say, where am I finding my identity? Where am I defining my identity? Where, where, where am I finding my belonging? Where am I trying to fit in? Where do I find my, my, my significance and my purpose in life? It's this self-assessment that I think we're all pretty difficult for us. It's difficult for us to have a sober self-assessment. What I mean by sober, I mean this, this okay, I'm going to be really. I'm not going to put up the facades or the, or, the, or the fronts anymore. This is who I am. It's this sober self-assessment. I think it's hard for us. Because in our humanity, it's been hard for us from the very beginning. It started all the way back in the garden with Adam and Eve at the very, very beginning. Would you look at Genesis chapter 3, the very first book of the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. We're picking up in the story of God here where Adam and Eve have just committed the, the, the sin, the fall of man. They've eaten of that fruit from the tree that God had commanded them not to eat of. They, 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 they broke the commands and the instructions of God. And they're, they're in the garden, and this is when God would come and He would fellowship with them and He would walk with them. And all of a sudden, they're hiding and God begins to ask them questions to make them self-evaluate themselves. I mean, he's asking them questions that he already knew the answer to. Because remember what I said earlier? You can put up your mask, you can put up your facades, and think you're fooling people around you. And the reality is God knows really who you are at the core of your being. He knew the answers. He's making Adam and Eve do a self 
assessment. Look at Genesis chapter 3, and in beginning in verse 8. They, being Adam and Eve, they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he knows where Adam is. He says, Where are you? And Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And he, being God, said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? He already knew they had. He already knew what they had done. It's like when you're asking your kid, you know, did you get in the cookies before? They're like chocolate on their face. No. Hmm, really? I mean, God knows us. And he asks him, he says, did you eat of the tree I commanded you not to? Verse 12. <laughs> the man said, the woman. <laughs> yep. Or. Then look at this. He goes on to say, the woman who you gave to be with me. God, this is your fault. You gave me her. The man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she gave me from the tree that I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? And the woman said, the serpent. The serpent deceived me and I ate. God is forcing them to go through this self-evaluation. And he asks them these questions. He's asking them these questions. And he says, where are you? And Adam says, I was afraid because I was naked. You see, we even today, like they did in the garden, we try to hide from God. We try to hide in the shadows so people don't see the real us. And we think we can hide in the shadows so God doesn't see the real us. And sometimes he's asking you, I already know these answers, but are you willing to be transparent and authentic with me and the people around you? And he asks Adam, where are you? He says, I, I was afraid because I was naked. You see, we hide in fear because of our shame. We don't want people to see the parts of us that maybe we're uncomfortable with. We think we can hide from God because we don't want Him to see parts that we know He wouldn't be pleased with. We, we try to hide in, in, in fear and in this fear that's rooted in this shame because we don't want people to see parts of us that we're not comfortable with. Parts of our life that we're not proud of. So, so we're fearful. We're fearful people may see the real me. Adam said, I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. You see, he was hiding himself in this insecurity that, that he didn't want to be seen by God. He didn't want to be vulnerable before God. And many times you and I hide in the shadows of life and we hide from people and we hide because we don't want people to see us. We don't want to be vulnerable in front of people. We don't want to be vulnerable to God. It's hard for us to open our life and say, God, you can see the real me. You can see all of me. And you may see things you need to change about me. And we definitely don't want to be vulnerable to the people around us. Because we don't want people to see us. Then Adam says this, well, it's not really my fault, it's the woman's fault. And the woman says, well, it's not really my fault, it's, it's, the, it's the serpent's fault. He deceived me. And so what we begin to do is we begin to blame that's rooted in our denial of who we are. Adam and Eve begin to blame because they weren't willing to take ownership to say, you know what, I messed up. You know what? I screwed up. You know what, God? Yes, we broke the commands that you gave us. And so many times, you and me in life, we go through life with this victim mentality. It's not my fault. It's the people around me's fault. It's not my fault. It's, it's, it's what he did to me. It's not my fault. It's what she did to me. It's not my fault. It's the circumstances of life. And we play this victim mentality. I call it drivers and passengers. 
Think about this, drivers and passengers in a car. You have two kinds of people. You have the drivers who are, are responsible for getting to the destination. So they kind of got to they kind of be pay attention. They kind of kind of have their mind not wander. They got to understand they got the, the the steering wheel in their hands as well as the life of the other people in their hands. And so they've got to get everybody to the destination. But a passenger really doesn't have to worry about those kind of things, right? Passenger just is, you know, you can text and, and you can be like having a good time, sing a song, you can be thinking about what you're doing. You have to really think about that. You just long for the ride. And you don't really know, you're at the mercy of the driver taking you to the destination. Well, so many people in life just live life as a passenger. They don't take responsibility for the destinations of their life. Let's go along for the ride. And so often, we go through life in denial of the responsibilities of my actions and the consequences that come with it. I don't want to be responsible for my actions, and I definitely don't want to deal with the consequences that come with it. It's got to be someone else's fault. Just the same way God in the garden was asking Adam and Eve, the same way that Paul in Romans chapter 12 says, it is time to stand in front of a mirror and look beyond the the mass that you have, and to put them down and look into the depths of who you are and say, who am I? Where am I putting my identity? Where, where, where am I finding my purpose? Where am I, where, where am I giving my, my who I am? But what we do is we hide. We hide emotionally. We hide mentally. We try to hide physically even sometimes. We project something that we think people would like. We act a certain way. We talk a certain way. We dress a certain way because we want people to, to, to not see the real us. But coming to grips with the real me, to coming to grips with the, the real me and following after Christ in my life starts with this. It starts with overcoming the shame that you feel. It starts with setting aside the insecurity that you have. It starts with, with stopping the denial of your actions and say, I have a self-assessment of my life that's real, that's authentic before God. And if I were to have a real, authentic, transparent assessment of my life, would my life be a life that God would be pleased with? Or would it be a life that God says there needs to be changes in? You may be saying, I need you to find your identity in me. I, I need you to find your sense of belonging as a child of mine. I need you to find your purpose in how I've designed you and how I've gifted you. But for some of us today, for some of you, it's time for you to stop hiding. It's time for you to stop pretending. And it's time to be real with yourself before God. And say, is the life that I'm living pleasing to you? Or do there need to be changes in who I am?